So Dorpaton has finally taken a stab at my digital physics argument, and now it's my turn to rebut his refutation. So what does he argue? He says that there are multiple definitions of local realism, and thus he argues that the violation of local realism doesn't necessarily contradict materialism. So what are the various definitions that he gives? He says that local realism could either mean a. locality is real, b. the principle of locality plus counterfactual definiteness, aka naive realism, and c. the principle of locality plus metaphysical realism. From the start, I agree with Thorpeton that definition C is a little redundant. If metaphysical realism is false, then of course locality will be false as well. Now if C is right, then I'm obviously right, so let's look at the other two instead. So firstly, let's take a look at locality. The principle of locality states that an object is influenced directly only by its immediate surroundings. Well, in precise physics language, how do we define immediate surroundings? Let's let Fotini Marcopolo explain. So, you could say that we are close, which is ultimately what you understand by space. Space is a description of who is close to whom. So we are close because we can interact. So you can ask me a question, I'll answer. If you don't like the question, you will complain. Uh, the answer, you complain, and so on. Um, so it is actually the interaction between us that um, is the reason why we say we are close. If you're there and I'm here, but for some physical weird reason, there could be no photons exchange between us, no sound waves and so on, would it make sense to say that we're close? If we never ever interact, we will for all practical purposes be in two different parts of so, the universe. So the, the nature of the space that we inhabit is defined by our ability to exchange information in the form of this interaction. Right. So you could say that um, exchanging information or interactions are in a way more fundamental than space-time. And in a sense, this is what general relativity says. It says that space-time is a physical um, thing that is the result of all the interactions that are happening in the world. So if two things having nearby locations is defined by their ability to be influenced by each other, then the principle of locality is really just about their locations having reality. However, if locality isn't real by this definition, locations aren't real either. And since space only has meaning in terms of locations, this would mean space wouldn't be real. But if space isn't real, then the matter in it isn't either. So if we define local realism as A, then this is not helpful in saving materialism. So now let's look at B, which is the principle of locality combined with counterfactual definiteness or naive realism. This is actually the definition used by the quantum Randy challenge that no one has been able to make a formulation of quantum mechanics compatible with. So this is really the one we have to be looking at. If this turns out to be incompatible with the materialism, then science is saying that materialism is out the window. So what is the scientific definition of counterfactual definiteness or naive realism? Counterfactual definiteness is the ability to speak meaningfully of the definiteness of results of measurements that have not been performed. In other words, that our perception actually correlates to something that really exists before we look at it. Now the physics is saying that this is actually quite impossible. Physics was saying that it was impossible back in 1925 with the double slit experiment. Of course, people didn't like this, and so they tried to explain it away. The first example was with Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, which is actually where the concept of local realism first entered the picture. The EPR experiment was conceived of as a test of whether or not we, what we perceive is real, and of course it was falsified by violations of Bell's inequalities, exactly as quantum mechanics had predicted. Then the gold pulse shifted again, which is where we get non-local hidden variables from. Only those were also falsified, this time by violations of Leggett's inequalities, also exactly as quantum mechanics had predicted from the very beginning. And of course, Wheeler proposed the delayed choice quantum eraser, in which it would be impossible for a material reality to cause the results, or relativity would be violated, but of course, people tried to explain that away too. Then we have the test of the koch specker theorem, which can't possibly fit into naive realism. It was basically the microscopic equivalent of the three cups in a ball of magic trick that you see magicians do at circuses. Uh, no matter which cup you pick, you get it wrong every single time, right? So what you see can't possibly be what was real there before. Now people tried to find loopholes to that too, and predictably these loopholes were recently disproven also. Lastly, we have the non-local quantum eraser done by Anton Zollinger last year, and the results were quite unequivocal. It says, and I quote, No naive realistic picture is compatible with our results, because whether a quantum could be seen as showing a particle or wave-like behavior would depend on a causally disconnected choice. It is therefore suggested to abandon such pictures altogether. Sorry, but you can't shift the goalposts anymore. Firstly, this is not how we do science, and besides, even if it was, you've run out of places to shift them to. Now the big question, is naive realism being wrong compatible with materialism? 
So our perceptions do not correlate to a material reality that exists before we do experiments, but let's assume that this is somehow compatible with materialism anyway. What would that mean? That would mean that this material reality would have to be causing our perceptions such that we are tricked into believing that those same perceptions are disconnected from the very material reality they are supposedly representing. So how did this matter know to trick our senses like that? Well, it would firstly have to be omniscient, since it would have to know every experiment we could possibly perform to test it, and it would have to be omnipotent, otherwise it would be able to plant every quantum state in the universe to deceive our senses into thinking that materialism is false. But it couldn't be God, since everyone knows God doesn't exist, so I guess it would have to be something like an omniscient, omnipotent flying spaghetti monster instead. So yes, I really should have put a fifth option in the video, namely that naive realism is in fact compatible with materialism, assuming that an omnipotent being planted all the quantum states in the universe to deceive us into believing that materialism is false. But of course, divinely planted fossils, or um, um, I mean, uh, quantum states, is absurd, and so we should just come to the obvious conclusion. The Bell inequality could be violated and quantum physics could stay intact if you allowed particles to communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. Now this would violate special relativity, but quantum mechanics would still be left intact, and the notion that there is an underlying reality would be left intact if you allowed particles to communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. Well, as it turns out, the legate inequality sort of takes away the last amount of freedom, the last degree of freedom that was still left over in the Bell inequality that I was just talking about. It's been hailed as the, both by the, the group in Vienna that made the measurement at my new scientist magazine, as pretty much ruling out not only non-locality, but also realism as a, uh, an explanation for how particles can be correlated with each other, and yet quantum mechanics predicts that the relationships between these measurements that you make are rather different quantum mechanically than they are if you assume that the particles could communicate with each other, or that they would be if the particles really have these properties and you're simply measuring them but you're not creating anything when you make the measurement, you're making a real objective measurement. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation, the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. What these experiments are telling us, the Leggett experiments, is that consciousness is creating both realities via observation. Now as a side note, some other people realizing that the game was up decided to posit macro realism instead, meaning that yes, the world isn't really real, or ma materially real anyway, but collapse can't terminate on consciousness because collapse only happens at the microscopic level. Well, this was falsified and also, just as quantum mechanics had predicted all along. Oh, and by the way, in case someone wants to sidestep this some more, the best known neural correlate of consciousness, uh, gamma synchrony, apparently exploits this fact. It operates on entanglement. Now, Dorpaton, I know in your video you said you believe solipsism is absurd, even though it's logically consistent as a hypothetical, and so this leaves us with only one possible alternative for the correct explanation, which is an alternative we would have realized had we listened to the science all along. And now I'll let Mishio Kaku very elegantly explain what the correct explanation is. Erwin Schrödinger, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, designed a thought experiment to drive home the strange rules of his theory. Let's say we put a cat and a vial of poison in a box. We add an atom of radioactive uranium and a Geiger counter. If the uranium decays, it sets off the Geiger counter, which then releases the poison and silently kills the cat. Before we open the box and look, we can't actually know whether the uranium has decayed or not, since radioactive decay is a probabilistic quantum event. Here's the question. Is the cat dead or alive? Well, according to quantum mechanics, the cat is neither dead nor alive, but the sum of the two states. Well, at that point, you say, well, that's nonsense. That's preposterous. How can you be both dead and alive simultaneously? Schrodinger's cat was supposed to show that nothing in this universe is certain until someone makes a measurement. But another pioneer of quantum mechanics, Eugene Wigner, believed it could teach us something else about the working of the universe. That consciousness 
controls everything. Bigner said, let's take it one step farther. If I, a human being, looks at the cat, I am conscious. Therefore, consciousness determines existence. At that point, Einstein went ballistic and said, what? You're saying that the fact that you are a conscious being determines the fact that the cat is alive? The answer is yes. And Wigner made one more step. And that is, how do I know I'm alive? You see, the cat and me, we're part of the same universe. If I don't know the cat is alive or dead, I could also be dead at the same time and not even know it. So who determines that I'm alive? Well, Wigner's friend looks at me, I look at the cat, and we exist. But then who looks at Wigner's friend? And there's an infinite chain of people looking at people, looking at people, until finally you hit cosmic consciousness. Some consciousness that's ethereal, that envelops the universe, which looks at us and says, aha, the cat is alive. Across the Federation, federal experts agree that A, God exists after all, B, he's on our side, and C, he wants us to win. If you like this video, subscribe, and don't forget to check out my novel, Alaris, The Lances of Light, on Amazon Kindle in the description below. Now you can find us on Facebook at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism. This mind is the matrix of all matter.